I'm in the middle of a series of episodes talking about leadership. My goal is to offer you some ways of thinking about the subject that both encourage and challenge you with a unique or at least less familiar perspective. Now, in a previous episode, I mentioned that life can be complicated and confusing at times. It can seem like there are too many choices with implications that are beyond figuring out. It can sometimes even feel like we've hit a wall, a dead end, and all of our efforts have been a waste. But it's in those times when you have to remind yourself that you aren't lost and that your situation may be hard, but it's most definitely not impossible or hopeless. I want to continue that theme for a little bit. In 2002, one of the true pioneers in the field of leadership studies, Warren Bennis, wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review in which he asked a simple question. What makes a leader? And perhaps equally as important, why is it that some people stumble again and again and again instead of becoming good leaders? Bennis admits that there are no simple answers to those questions, but he was intrigued by one particular aspect of leadership development that seemed to continually pop up, the different ways that people deal with adversity. He went on to share that the research his team was doing at that time led them to conclude that, quote, One of the most reliable indicators and predictors of true leadership is an individual's ability to find meaning in negative events and to learn from even the most trying circumstances, end quote. In other words, the skills required to conquer adversity and emerge stronger and more committed than ever are the same exact skills that make for really good leaders. They actually noticed this trend when they were researching the content for Bennis' 2002 book titled Geeks and Geezers. They had interviewed 43 different leaders from two very specific generations, hence the title Geeks and Geezers. They originally set out to learn how the era and values that we grow up in shapes how we lead. And what they discovered was something far more profound, something they called crucibles, quote, Utterly transforming periods of testing from which one can emerge either hopelessly broken or powerfully emboldened to learn and to lead. End quote. Every single leader that they interviewed, young and old, was able to point to these intense, often traumatic, and always unplanned experiences that had transformed them and had become the sources of their distinctive leadership abilities. The so-called crucible experience was a trial and a test, a point of deep self-reflection that forced them to question who they were and what mattered most. It required them to examine their values, to question their assumptions, to hone their judgment. Now, I've had a number of those in my own life, as I'm sure you've had as well. One of the first for me was when I was finishing up my third semester of college I wasn't really doing very well in my classes. I was incredibly distracted by some very painful personal problems. And I was just, generally speaking, losing my way in life. So, on what, in hindsight, seemed like a whim, I'm sure it didn't seem that way at the time, I packed up my car with a few belongings and I left Tennessee to go live in Washington State for a while with a good friend. My few months in Washington State did not improve my situation. I struggled to find work, and I had no real sense of purpose or direction in my life. And on top of all that, I was stuck a long, long way from home. So I followed that one rash decision with another rash decision. I joined the Army. Boot camp was every bit as terrifying as it sometimes made out to be, or at least it was back in those days. It was physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausting. It took me about 30 minutes to realize that the very best thing I could do was to keep my head down, my mouth shut, and try not to be noticed by the dragon-powered eyes and ire of the drill sergeants. Now that sort of worked, except for that one time when a drill sergeant literally pushed me down because he didn't think I was doing a drill to his specific standard. Instinctively, and yes, rashly, I jumped up. I snapped to attention and I yelled, Drill Sergeant, you have no right to push me down, Drill Sergeant. 
the fury that man unleashed on me for the next four to six hours was the stuff of pure nightmares. Needless to say, I survived. In fact, it was kind of a turning point for me. Other drill sergeants and fellow recruits started looking to me as a kind of a leader. An extremely reluctant leader, of course, but a leader nonetheless. And once I graduated from boot camp, I was immediately assigned to be the assistant platoon guide for my 16-week advanced training. And I was given all sorts of special privileges and responsibilities, and I even wound up being the honor graduate. It was during those 24 long, lonely, grueling weeks that I did a lot of soul searching. I had this little pocket Bible, Psalms, Proverbs, and the New Testament. And I read that thing cover to cover so many times it literally fell apart on me. And it was in that crucible that I realized what really mattered to me was not the personal problems I was working through. It was the assignment that I felt like God had given me years before to go back to school, focus, and become a youth pastor. So that's exactly what I did. And I'm convinced that none of the many, many, many blessings in my life today would have ever materialized had I not gone through that crucible and rediscovered what really mattered most in my life. Bennis says that the, quote, leadership crucibles can take many forms. Some are violent, life-threatening events, and others are more prosaic episodes of self-doubt, end quote. But whatever the crucible's nature, the people they spoke with for their research were able to create a narrative around it, a story of how they were challenged, how they met that challenge, and they became better leaders because of it. It's really the classic hero's journey, made popular by Professor Joseph Campbell. In a nutshell, the reluctant hero is living in the so-called ordinary world when something causes him to receive a call to adventure. Usually the hero tries to refuse the call, but ends up accepting it, at which point he departs and is initiated into this special world where he faces a series of challenges that will either make or break him. Eventually, the hero has to return to the familiar, but he has been forever changed by that crucial experience. According to Bennis, it's a combination of hardiness and, above all, an ability to grasp the purpose and power of the crucible context that allows a person to not only survive an ordeal, but to learn and grow from it instead of being destroyed by it, to find opportunity where other people might find only despair. The New Living Translation of James 1, 2-4 says this, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. The famous Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, once said, Trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and they let us see what we're made of. As a young college student, I had allowed my painful circumstances to almost completely derail my life. I know now what I was soon to learn back then. That was the wrong way to think. My situation may have been hard, but it was most definitely not impossible or hopeless. It took a nine-month crucible to help me finally see that. But eventually, I came around, and I am so very deeply thankful that I did. Today, that and several other key crucibles have transformed me into living proof that a better mind always leads to a better life.